minded cat hath mewed. Thrice and once the hedge pig whined. Harpier cries, tis time, tis time. Round about the cauldron go, in the poison entrails throw. Toad that under cold stone, days and nights has thirty one. Sweltered venom, sleeping got, boil thou first in the charmed pot. Devil, devil, toil and trouble, fire burn and cauldron bubble. Fillet of a fenny snake in the cauldron boil and bake. Eye of newt and toe of frog, wool of bat and tongue of dog. Adder's fork and blind worm's sting. Lizard's leg and owlet's wing. For the charm of powerful trouble, like a hell broth boil and bubble. I was working in the lab late one night <laughs> when my eyes beheld an eerie sight. My monster from his slab began to rise and suddenly, to my surprise, he did the mash. <laughs> Once again, the Greg Proofs Film Club is taking to the ether here from the salubrious confines. <laughs> of the Cine family here in the uh, athletic shoe district of Fairfax Avenue here <laughs> in bustling Hollywood. Uh, it's part of, uh, what are they calling it? Fright Fest? What is it? Nightmare City. Nightmare City, where the grass is green and no one is pretty. <laughs> oh, won't you please take me home? And uh, tonight we're going to be showing Return of the Living Dead, the 1985 <laughs> classic written and directed by Dan O'Bannon. If you're listening in Proopcast land, if you're at work now, this is an awesome time to download this on Netflix or find it somewhere on the interweb illegally and queue it up because we're going to play the movie and then afterward we're going to talk about the movie. But first, uh, let's talk about when I first saw Return of the Living Dead. I, was, I lived in San Francisco in the 80s and there was a movie theater there called The Strand and it was on Market Street. I think the first time I was taken up was like 75, 76 maybe. Uh, we went up to San Francisco to a, a theater called The Egypt on Market Street, which was like a total no man's land, right? It was like Escape from New York. There was a head on a stick and Ernest Borgnine is there and get in, kid, you know, like it was bad. And The Egypt had a cage that the candy guy s sat behind so that you slid the money underneath prison style, right? And they slid the fucking candy back out. And they took me to see Rocky Horror Picture Show at midnight. And I was, you know, 16 from San Carlos, which is white, uh, home of the Plain Yogurt Festival. That's how white San Carlos was. <laughs> and uh, take the fruit out. The powerful taste is burning our tongues. Um, so it was very exciting for me to go to San Francisco, and uh, we always loved to go. And there was a, a, a young, wasted, uh, uh, runaway gay boy wearing a T-shirt that had two pigs having uh, physical love on the front of it. And it said, how's your, oh, Macon Bacon, I believe. And... Um, there was a black man on the street wearing a, a, a cone on his head, and he was going, oh, Moses was black, it stands to reason. Jesus was black, it stands to reason. And then we went inside, and I bought candy from the guy uh, under the, the prison slide. And then we went inside, and it was drag queens. There was a black drag queen wearing, and I never will forget this, what appeared to be a DNA molecule on his head. It was this, like, <laughs> an elaborate construction of, of foil and tinker toys and whatnot. And he had no shirt at all, and everyone was smoking pot copiously and doing every manner of drugs. And they were playing Lady Marmalade by... Um, <laughs> By LaBelle, yeah. So everybody was dancing before the movie started. Uh, Voulez-vous coucher avec moi? And then the movie started, and I'd never seen it and didn't know it at all. And it starts with the rain and all of a sudden the squirt gun, so I'm covered with moisture, and I was like, this is wild, right? Um, I have no idea what this moisture is, but I've seen the crowd. And... Um, <laughs> The Strand was the kind of place people lived. In the old days, movie theaters uh, ran all day, grind houses, right? And they, uh, uh, it was like $2 to go, and you could just stay as long as you wanted. It was a triple bill almost every day. Uh, it was a triple bill every day, and it played over and over and over again. So guys lived there, basically. You'd go to the Strand Theater on Market Street, and there, the door would swing open halfway through because some guy would go outside to take a leak, and it would stay open the whole movie until you got up and went over and closed it because the usher was not leaving the counter. At any point, were they going to attend to anything happening inside the Strand Theater? Upstairs, there was a balcony. Inside the balcony was an alcove. The alcove was secluded. Are you following me? <laughs> men, men would meet for, how do I say it, assignations uh, in the corner up there uh, in a free and easy manner. There was a terrible latitude shown by the management to every manner of debauchery that could take place inside the four walls of a theater that you'd pay $2 to go in and spend all day in. 
Uh, many fine triple bills did I see there, but the first time I saw Return of the Living Dead was on a triple bill with this, uh, Larry Cohen's The Stuff. And uh, thank you. And the original Little Shop of Horrors, the Roger Corman one. And uh, we went upstairs so we could smoke pot. And of course, as you're upstairs, you had to be careful of the alcove because at various points in the movie, a man would come up the staircase to the alcove and go, and you're like, mm -mm, I'm good. And. Uh, <laughs> But let me just say, put it this way. Not a lot of theaters offer you free stuff. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, I love it here at CineFamily, but they didn't go like, hey, come in the corner and I'll get it going with you. Uh, maybe we should bring that back. I'm going to seek out a CineFamily alcove here. We're going to call it the, the Proops Loop, and that's where you'll sit on a special couch. Yeah, you heard me. You can spoon, you can do whatever you like. No judgment. As a result, the floors of the Strand were indescribable. I don't know if H.P. Lovecraft ever got near describing the miasma that was the floor of the Strand Theater. It was almost as if you had to burn your clothes and your shoes each time you went there. Uh, we remember smoking dope and watching uh, Return of the Living Dead, and it was the funniest goddamn movie. And I hope it still is. I think it still is. I know it still is. Uh, Dan O'Bannon is an amazing, uh, legendary figure in Hollywood. He died a few years ago of Crohn's disease, which he suffered from his entire life. People thought he was faking sometimes. Um, he wrote the original screenplay with his partner, uh, uh, um, uh, of To Alien, and so, uh, which is a very Lovecraftian kind of uh, motif, right? The, the octopusy like creature that sucks onto your face and whatnot, and uh, then uh, eventually he, um, he uh, Ronald Schusset was his partner, and um, then he made this picture. He directed uh, Return of the Living Dead. He also, uh, I think, wrote the initial uh, story to uh, Total Recall as well, and uh, he has, he made, he's just a uh, He's subversive, and that's what I like about him. In Alien, the point is not that the alien is bad or that it's a movie about cancer and one by one people are getting picked off and there's nothing they can do about it and humans are just flailing against an extraterrestrial intelligence that they have no understanding of. It's also a movie about corporations fucking over blue-collar workers, and that's what makes it awesome. He's, he's John Sayles with poison that goes through floors. If John Sayles had set Mate One on a spaceship, think about it. Uh -huh. So uh, he's, and then in the, and this movie is a bit subversive like that too. I'm not going to talk at all about the plot of this movie because I think you'll get the idea. Um, he made it uh, on a John Russo novel. John Russo was um, well, George Romero's partner, and they made Night of the Living Dead. Well, they split the Living Dead franchises right down the middle, and all of the Living Dead ones are uh, uh, are John Russo, and all of the of the dead ones are Ramiro, right? Dawn of the Dead and all that jazz. This is the first and greatest, in my opinion, of all the sequels because all the rules are broken in this. This is a couple of quotes I wanted to read you from uh, O'Bannon. Uh, he was considered one of the most brilliant, if volcanic, alumni of the USC Film School. He went there with John Carpenter and they made a movie called Dark Star uh, from 1974 that is an awesome movie. Um, he was talking about Total Recall. Verhoeven has moments. He's talented, and he has some grand sci-fi visual things to see from time to time. But he's a very flawed director, and Total Recall had a lot of pitfalls for him, and he fell into most of them. <laughs> in particular, whenever he started to flounder and didn't know what to do, he'd start throwing in violence. He'd say, bring in all the rubber body parts and the blood hoses and everything, and we'll start ripping people to shreds and squirt blood everywhere. And he'd keep shooting that until he overcame his nerves and got his feet on the ground. And he would start directing in some reasonable way again. So you'd end up with these intermittent scenes of absurdly excessive maimings at sort of intervals, and usually what he was substituting for were scenes that involved humor in the original script. And I realized, oh, he's not good at humor. He doesn't know how to tell a joke on screen. Too bad, because some of the important stuff he did very well in Total Recall, it had grand moments. Uh, the, the scene where he shoots Sharon Stone, his ex-wife, and, uh, and he goes, consider that a divorce. <laughs> That's a Dan O'Bannon line. Um, and isn't it exciting that our, our former governor is out on the road with his book, My Struggle? Um, <laughs> does anyone deserve to have a bestseller more than him right now? Isn't it? A, oh, my goodness. What, an Austrian strongman takes over a flailing economy and a, what can only be described as a putsch and then goes on to be one of the most licentious and duplicitous governors of all time. Fuck his movies. Let's have the documentary on Arnold Schwarzenegger now. Pumping Iron was nothing. This one would be, this one would be called He's Good with the Help. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
We're, uh, if you want to write me, it's at smartest at uh, specialthing.com and we answer questions, not on the Greg Proops Film Club, but on the uh, Smartest Man in the World one, which runs both simultaneously and mandatorily uh, alongside this one uh, in your dreams each night. Uh, as you fall asleep, you will both think of the Smartest Man in the World podcast as a purple unicorn running atop a lime green rainbow, and then you'll think of the Greg Proops Film Club as an effervescent waterfall that bubbles into a, a turquoise pond that's never ending with tiny fish jumping up and down, spurting multicolored bubbles from their mouth as their way of communicating their love to you. Uh, fan mail for Greg at gmail.com if you want to uh, communicate with me. I do answer them, although I haven't in a couple days, but give me a fucking break. Uh, the 13th will be at the LA Podcast Fest uh, of October. Uh, the 20th of October will be at the Mesa Center for the Performing Arts. That's in Phoenix, Arizona, for anyone who lives in that area uh, in the high desert there. Autumn is a marvelous time to leave your home. And come to the Mesa Center for the Performing Arts. I'll be performing arts that night, by the way. In case anyone thinks I just do a mixture of vaudeville, dick jokes, and obscure fucking references, I will be doing uh, the. I'll be doing an aria from Rigoletto. Uh, I'll be also be doing a pas de deux from Travinsky's *The Rites of Spring*. If anyone wants to know, in my own way. Uh, I'll be in Donvier, Colorado, uh, site of the last triumphant debate. Uh, on uh, December, on October 25th, so I played in Colorado after Obama had been nominated there, and the cloud of hope had barely dissipated. And now, when I go back, I feel that there's going to be a black cloud like the book A Wrinkle in Time. Thank you. Uh, on the November of 7th, we'll be at the Bar Lubitsch over in Western Hollywood, across from the Pleasure Chest. It is, of course, October, and uh, when we go back there, it'll be uh, November. Uh, the 8th of uh, yes the subsequent night Greg you dare to do two podcasts on subsequent nights right here in the confines of Los Angeles knowing that there's only a limited amount of hipsters Um, (laughs) yes I do Uh, I think Tori Spelling said it best when she said mother may I sleep with danger That'll be at Nerd Melt over on Sunset uh, where all of the people um, tonight are buying a graphic novel of this movie the 14th will be back at the Lubitsch, which is a vodka bar. And there, is vodka in this? One wonders. Maybe I can cast a spell. If I had any sense of smell, or I could hear, or I could see, I wouldn't have this job. I would be a cheese taster in Provence. I really would. My name would be Gilbert, and I'd be insufferable. This Morbier hasn't aged enough. I can't believe you have the inconsideration and gall to put it on a fucking cracker and give it to me. <laughs> Look at the veins on it. They're paltry. Can't you wait until it's rich and glutinous? Let's try this cheese. Oh, for fuck's sake. Really? I would like to meet the goat that this chevre has emanated from so that I may apologize to them for the mistreatment upon the moment of this milk being delivered from them. I would be an awesome cheese critic. I have no sense of smell. I mean, I have some sense of smell. I smoke a lot of dope. It takes away your sense of smell. We'll be at the Soho Theater in London. Uh, I know a lot of you guys are going over to London in December. Uh, for our London friends, uh, Chim Chim fucking Chiru. Good luck will rub off when I shake hands with you. Oh, blow me a kiss, and that's lucky too. I'll be going to London on the, the 2nd of December. I told you, you're only supposed to blow the bloody doors off! Then the 19th of December will be at the attic in Bloomington, Indiana. I have no idea. <laughs> Taking a chance on love Here I go again Going back Midwest again Gonna go to Bloomington again Taking a chance on the comedy attic Uh, Everyone that plays there is cool So I'm gonna go I think it's gonna be groovy Uh, uh, On the 30th of December We'll be at the Punchline in San Francisco That's right before New Year's We'll be there all New Year's weekend In in my beloved San Francisco Um, uh, So come and visit us there And all those things and like that and stuff. Um, I'm at Return of the Living Dead 2, which is the sequel to this and has nothing to do with this movie. In San Francisco, whenever it came out, two years after this, this is 85, 
Uh, Return of the Living Dead 2, I think, is maybe two years after. We went to the Alhambra, which was on Geary Street. If anyone's ever been to it, it was a bitchin' theater. It had minarets, right? And uh, 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 so it's an afternoon matinee, like on a Tuesday. Me and my roommate, who was a, kind of a pot dealer. And uh, <laughs> so we're high, and we go to see uh, Return of the Living Dead 2. And uh, it's us and 13 high school students, right? <laughs> Because who else has time in the middle of the day? And uh, so we go, and, and that one, someone's hiding under a table, and one of the zombies comes in and goes, <laughs> and the black girl behind us goes, mm, he can smell them brains. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking, that was so funny. <laughs> The movie wasn't so hot, as the Everly Brothers said. It didn't have much of a plot. We fell asleep, our goose is cooked, our reputation is shot. But when she fucking yelled that out, it made it the best movie of all time. <laughs> I'm going to start a story here, and Ron, I want you to tell me if I've told this story before. I'm at a theater in San Francisco, and I think we were seeing War Games, if anybody remembers that fine motion picture. Yeah, a lot of times people forget Ali Sheedy's early work. <laughs> Matthew Broderick and Ali Sheedy, he taps into a computer when computers were like this big and moved like, a, like they were like Pong and shit. The words came up one at a time, does not compute and shit, you know. And uh, he takes over the defense system. I don't remember the fucking... Anyways, before the movie started, they showed a preview for uh, Weekend at Bernie's. And yeah, if anyone remembers that awesome movie... The premise of Weekend at Bernie's is two guys go to Florida have a fucking weekend with their friend and shit and fucking the guy dies but they fucking pretend he's alive! <laughs> and they go skiing with him, water skiing. So they put him on skis and of course he's a dead corpse and he hits every buoy and that's one of the scenes in the preview. Just a corpse hitting a buoy with its head. <laughs> bang! 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 Then Bernie at the party they put a drink in his hand and a cigarette and shit and he's got a visor on. And this poor son of a bitch actor had to play Bernie through the whole fucking movie. Movie, right? And these Chinese kids were in the Richmond district. These Chinese kids behind us, one of them goes, man, I got to see that one. And I was like, because I was just about to turn to my friend and go, who's going to see this fucking movie? And then it, it was answered for me. And I, oh, one man's piece of shit is another man's fucking grand illusion. You know what I'm saying? And I don't mean the sticks album. Although I will say Domo Arigato. <laughs> uh, did I tell this one? I was at Coyote Ugly. I think I told this one. Uh, did I? Okay, fuck that one. Here comes another one. We went to see Brazil. Have I told this one? And Br when Brazil came out, 1953. And um, marvelous. Everyone was smoking in the theater. I had a derby on. <laughs> We pulled up in our carriage. Take this away, boy, and don't scratch it. Remember to tender the horses, you knave. Enough of your jack and apery. Come, my dear. I seem to have lost a glove. What again? And my monocle falls out. Oh, bruh. I have a cigar in a holder. And uh, so we go to see Brazil, and it was at the Clay Theater in San Francisco, which is still there, and fantastically arty. Like every, like the Proust movie showed there, you know, the Jeremy Irons one, Swan's Way, and uh, like it was, uh, I, think, I think I saw Diva there like five times when I was like 22. I thought Diva was really good then. Uh, further viewings on cable have revealed that no amount of pot makes it coherent. <laughs> Uh, however, it's quite charming and it's, it's in its own special 80s way. Uh, in any case, we go to see Brazil there and uh, they show this Henry Yaglom uh, trailer, right? Now, I don't know if you're familiar with the films of Henry Yaglom. I'm not here to take Henry Yaglom out in any way. I will say this. Uh, uh, his movies are personal. How about that? And it's with a cast of people that are generally people he knows. Now, in the preview to this one, this was, when did Brazil come out? 90? 89? Uh, uh, it's him and, like, a woman who's playing his wife. And they're broken up, clearly. And the scene is a static two-shot of them. And he goes, so who are you fucking? And she goes, what? And he goes, who are you fucking? And she goes, what do you mean, who am I fucking? And he goes, who are you fucking? And she goes, what? I mean, what, you asking me who I'm fucking? And he goes, I'm saying, who are you fucking? And she goes, who am I fucking? And the crowd starts to go, boo! And just fucking hisses this movie. Ah, 
that one, the Bay Area. I don't know if you've ever been to a movie in the Bay Area, but when the no smoking fucking card would come up, people would go like that and clap for it and shit. Just fucking horrible, right? Just, just insufferable liberals. Just horrible. It always makes me want to stand up and go, Hitler was a non-smoking vegetarian, you assholes. You're running with a fast crowd. I would be, I would hold off before I started applauding the no smoking sign. Because the next one is no Lithuanians. You know what I'm saying? You know what comes after no smoking. You know what comes after no smoking. So they hiss this fucking Henry Yaglom trailer down, right? I don't even remember if they finished it or if they pulled it, which they might have done. The projectionist just kind of poof. You know, like coming in June. And it was always movies like the Turkey Winner of the Golden Yak. <laughs> Turkey's fourth highest achievement in cinematic excellence. It was a time of doubt. It was a time of renewal. It was a time when there was no difference between right and wrong. Everybody get to the thing! So the next preview, after the fucking Henry Aguam one, that is booed roundly by the crowd, is Shoah, which is a documentary about the Holocaust and is the least funny thing that has ever been shown. The preview is simply black screen followed by white lettering that goes, in 1939, the Germans invaded. The crowd lasts about half a minute. There's no music, just the scroll of words. Then the Nazis consumed Poland. Their juggernaut of evil was one of no voiceover, nothing. People just watching. And then from the back. <laughs> and then the fucking floodgates opened. <laughs> then it was no! And then <laughs> fucking five minutes of a show up preview laughed through in hysteria, absolute fucking embarrassed, like we had eaten someone, like the novel perfume. Like we'd eaten someone and we were all looking at each other after licking our fingers. <laughs> oh fuck. <laughs> Can you believe we just did that? We're laughing at a Holocaust trailer. People were like, ah! <laughs> and then it finishes, and people were like, oh, <laughs> oh fuck, you gotta be kidding me. The best fucking trailers I've ever seen. Then Brazil came on, and people were judgmental. Uh, it's a marvelous movie. I'm at a movie uh, called Subway by Jean. What the fuck is his name? It's a Christophe Lambert movie from the late 80s. Uh, if you remember Christophe Lambert's oeuvre, uh, the, the high points are include uh, The Sicilian by Michael Cimino and, of course, uh, Highlander, which is unforgettable. Uh, I've done it before on the show. I'm going to do it again right now. He's in the police station, Christophe Lambert. He plays a Scottish nobleman who's, of course, from France. <laughs> Or rather, a French actor who's incapable of doing a Scottish accent, and so he's splitting the difference. <laughs> One of the policemen says, You talk funny, where are you from? And he goes, I'll hound. <laughs> Jean Bess Luc Besson, Luc Besson made Subway. Uh, it has two unforgettable lines. Isabel Huppert says to her rich boyfriend in subtitles, You are smothering me, Mr. Moneybags. And yes, yes, it's fucking good. If you haven't seen it, you're smothering me, comma, in the fucking titles, Mr. Moneybags. I didn't know you could say Mr. Moneybags. I didn't know you could say Knuckle Sandwich until I saw Showgirls and realized that it, it wasn't dead. You could say Knuckle Sandwich. How'd you like a Knuckle Sandwich? Fucking, I didn't know we were still serving those. I thought, I thought John Garfield said they were off the menu. Wow. You're smothering me, Mr. Moneybags. And then later she's got a gun and he says, she is Cinderella and that is her magic wand. We took mushrooms before the movie started. So I can only describe my state at the end as tripping balls. The movie broke halfway through. They live in a subway. There's a subterranean group of rebels that live in a subway. I know what you're thinking. Of course there are, Greg. 
It's called Subway, not on the surface box town. The film breaks. It's a Sunday night, the last show. So it's like it started at 10.45. Now it's fucking, you know, 12.45, 12.30. And a guy gets up in front of us in the house, in the cinema, with a camera in those days, a flash camera, and goes, I want to remember this night forever, and takes a picture of the audience. I'm hoping that that kind of magic strikes us here tonight. This is a movie about paranoia and delusion. This is a movie about horrible nightmares that come true. This is a movie about a situation that you can't control. This is a movie, in essence, that is about all of our own lives, written broadly across the vast fucking cinematic screen in 80s comedy horror uh, by Dan O'Bannon. If you are getting ready to watch the movie, cue it up right now, because we're about to get going here. Uh, Scale of Dragon... Tooth of Wolf. I think it'll be funnier if I read it as Margaret Hamilton from The Wizard of Oz. <laughs> Which is mummy, Mongolf. So, uh, liver of blaspheming Jew, a gall of goat and slips of you, silvered in the moon's eclipse, nose of Turk, <laughs> and the Tartar's lips. Finger of a birth strangled babe, ditch delivered by a drab, make the gruel thick and slab. And there to a tiger's chaudron for the ingredients of our cauldron. Double, double, toil and trouble, fire, burn, and cauldron bubble. Cool it with a baboon's blood. Then the charm is firm and good. By the pricking of my thumbs, something wicked this way comes. I give you Return of the Living Dead. <laughs> Zombie-tastic. And uh, uh, those zombies can run and nothing kills them. Uh, And they talk and they order more cops and more paramedics. They're the most awesome zombies in any zombie movie. There's no question of it. They have a sense of... They're inventive. Uh, The tar man in the beginning, uh, when when she's trapped in the the, uh, closet, gets a chain and hooks it to the door and uses a pulley effect uh, in full control of Archimedes' laws of physics. and uh, I mean, the, the humans in the movie are yelling at each other and crazy and have no idea what to fucking do, and the zombies seem organized. <laughs> when the cops come and the paramedics come, they're hiding, and then when they go like, hey, what's going on? They all come running out at once, and it works again and again and again. <laughs> and then awesomely, the movie ends with the end of the world. When, the last redoubt of the screenwriter when you just go, you know what? Fuck it. Uh, the zombies are so smart and I've made them so smart through the whole fucking movie and Clue Gulliger in his members-only jacket cannot defy them. That gray members-only jacket deserves its own award, I think. The 80s-ness of this movie is what makes it so unbelievably awesome to me. I saw it when I was, uh, oh, six or seven years old. And... Um, <laughs> I don't feel that well. Hang on, you guys. <laughs> and uh, the, the, there is there, there, let me just put it this way. I think Coolio said it best, or to paraphrase him, there ain't no punk like an 80s punk. Can a, the 80s punk don't stop. Uh, it was so well after punk had expired, and uh, yet there's a dude with a full nose ring chain outfit. Um, and he is one of the best characters in the movie. And, of course, Linnea Quigley, uh, exactly. I don't... Uh, nowadays, she's rarely spoken of, only in hushed tones and clenched teeth in darkened corridors. Uh, but there was a time when she strode the earth like an allosaurus, uh, <laughs> slaying where she would. Uh, I, um, soror- death zombies at the sorority bolorama? I can't... What was it? Sorority Babes and the Slime Ball Bolorama. Thank you, because I had no idea what the name of the movie was. I knew it had Bolorama in it somewhere, and that was really her big one. But this one, I think, is the one that Linnea Quigley, uh, when she passes, they'll be showing a clip from this movie. <laughs>
And quite right, because not only does she get naked and uh, is is not only topless in the movie, but awesomely bottomless through a good deal of the movie. There's really not a lot of movies where you can say someone's bottomless through the movie and then later complains that no one has given her a towel. And then wants part of her friend's awesome Paula Abdul sling shift dress, blue turquoise thing. Uh, really every fashion uh, uh, of the 80s is represented in this movie. The girlfriend um, who's wearing the irretrievable fucking white bead necklace that's just like yeah that's beyond beyond there's gross and there's gross there's zombies eating brains but there's the white bead necklace the high waisted pants and the flip back hair and then the girl in the turquoise Paula Abdul forever your girl dress and then there's the 80s punk and then there's Linnea and then there's the new wave dude who's all sweaty through the movie why is he so sweaty is he on coke why is he so sweaty and then there's fucking um, super freak, super freak, he's super freaky, yow, and has all of the best lines in the movie later. What does he say toward the end? That's a good idea. Uh, they are the best 80s punk gang, I will wager, in any parody zombies movie from that year. I don't want to go out on a limb on that, but I'm, I'm gonna. Uh, I, think it, I think it totally holds up. I think that it... At the time, as you might imagine, it was wildly humorous. Um, uh, I believe they use um, landlines, and later in the movie, a dial phone. If anybody wants to take you back to the day there, bro. Uh, a dial phone to this generation is like me watching a phone in the Untouchables where they hold it like this. <laughs> Get me the exchange on the line. I need Gramercy 459. Uh, yeah, he dials the number of the uh, government. And all those awesome keys that they're using that are like adding machine keys. Uh, I like that part. <laughs> it was nostalgic. Um, no one took out their iPhone and went, fuck, I'm going to yelp and see if the zombies like brains in this area. <laughs> or if the zombies went like, the brains aren't that fresh or whatever. And, and really, they were in Louisville, Kentucky? When was that evident at any point in the fucking movie? <laughs> Louisville, fucking New York, California, L.A., Kentucky is where they were. There's no fucking 80s punks in Louisville, Kentucky like that. And maybe there were. Maybe this was an accurate depiction. I believe in some ways there's a lot of truthfulness in this movie. Uh, I think it, it, it talks about a lot of what's happening today. Um, you don't know that there's not a zombie in a, a, a case full of trioxin somewhere, uh, right even underneath L.A. here. Uh, there's so much nefarious shit going on. That's all I am. I'm just saying that Dan O'Bannon, in his paranoia, wasn't necessarily um, uh, erroneous, perhaps over emphatic. But uh, uh, also, how funny is fucking James Karen and Clue Gulliger in this movie? Um, yeah. They're hilarious. James Karen is still alive. I was at Musos just this year and saw him flirting with the fucking hostess who was 100. And it was... <laughs> James Karen's super awesome and was personal friends with Buster Keaton. Clue Gulliver's still alive, too, and was in a thousand cowboy movies. Um, I think they give it that old movie emphasis that the movie really needs, and it is an old movie. I believe at one point he says to uh, the young boy when they're looking at the zombies, look alive, yeah. right? It's like a 1935 movie. Um, that part's groovy chickens. Um, Robbo here, if he's still sober enough, is going to... Does anyone want to talk or ask any questions or just engage about this movie at all? Because that's what we're going to do for the last few minutes, and then we're going to fuck off into this good night. And I want to thank you all very much for coming. I hope you had a good time. I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, the Surfin' Dead song by The Cramps at the end is worth the price of admission. And twice the same shot of the same skeleton coming out. <laughs> Once when the zombies take over and then once when the world ends and 45 Grave Place, do you want to party? And that, I think, really says a lot about the movie and how much Americans can enjoy themselves in a free and open society that's not trammeled by a dictatorship and fettered by fucking people whose minds are blinkered toward what would be normally uh, those who would fly like a, you know, a locust on the wind. <laughs> I don't think I've overstated my case at all. What's, yes, who are you and where do you sit? I can't see nor can I hear. Here. What up, Brohelm? Uh, What's your name? This, uh, this is, I'm Jess. 
Jess? Yeah, Jess Steiner. Hello, Jess. You, you needn't give both your names, but thank you, Jess Steiner. I'm Greg Proops. <laughs> nice to meet you. Nice to um, meet you, Jess Steiner. If, if not this film, which it may be, what is your favorite horror soundtrack? Oh, golly. Uh, th this one's right up there because I just think it keeps kicking along. And every time you... There's a Rocky Erickson song in this movie when they put... James Karen uh, commits himself to the uh, 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 incendiary grave and, and, and he feels so sorry for himself. And that's why James Karen's character is so great. When he turns into a zombie, he doesn't want to eat brains. He feels awful about it. And, uh, <laughs> and then incinerates himself. And that, that's a Rocky Erickson song. I think they got to make... I don't know if he made it just for this movie, but uh, if you know anything about Rocky Erickson, he's kind of a... I don't know... What would you say? A, a, a Sid Barrett, Skip Spence type, you know, like a mildly or possibly quite disturbed and, uh, and yet carried on. Uh, he was in a group called the 13th Floor Elevators. And it, it's just beyond, beyond that. Thank you. Uh, that, there was a, that, they, that they got him to do a song for a soundtrack of an 80s fucking horror parody rock movie. Uh, I, your question was, what other horror movie soundtracks do I like the goodest? Or just in general, any That's movie? Right. What, what? That's right. Oh, horror movies. Um, golly. I, I think all those um, 70s... Uh, well, first of all, uh, the, uh, the uh, 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 Dario Argento movies that have the Goblin soundtrack to me. Uh, if you were listening to the pre-show music, I put Witch on there. Uh, and also um, the uh, Le Le Vampiros Lesbos soundtrack too, uh, which is... I think those are... My wife like burned it into me, and, and I love them beyond all measure. I think the song Witch from the movie Suspiria was on the pre-show music, which is just like... A, 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 <laughs> and every every Dario Argento movie at some point someone goes la 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 to, to indicate insanity and uh, that that's good horror soundtrack he to me to my mind the goblins are the Ennio more more Coney more Coney of uh, of uh, of horror film um, I mean I think the Hammer movies have some groovy soundtracks and the Corman ones but like. Um, I, I want it to be groovy, you know what I mean? Uh, on top of um, just uh, uh, okay. Um, obviously, Bernard Herrmann. I think the Psycho soundtrack it might be like the, you know, the the, the epitome at the Beethoven of all horror movie soundtracks because it, it it's utterly compelling and no one ever forgets it. If you once you see that picture, you never forget that piece of music. And uh, uh, what, what did Arthur Clarke call that? An earworm, right? It stays. It, it stays with you. Does anyone else want to? Uh, uh, Here's, a young, here's some young people over here who have uh, unbelievable queries in their minds. Hello, hello. Hi. Hi. Uh, I just want to say my name is Jake. Uh, Daniel Bannon, the director, he was actually an uncle of mine. He was, oh, awesome. He was married to my, uh, my grandma's sister, so he's like my great uncle in law. You know, he passed a few years ago. Uh, I love this movie. I've seen it dozens of times. I have it on DVD. It's, uh, I just, you know, it's exciting to see it in a theater, you know, where I'm a member of. And I'm glad all you guys came out. I just want to say thank you. He would have really appreciate it. This was a very, very nice screening. Thank you, guys. Well, very nice of you. It is great to see it in a movie theater. Uh, Ryan was saying before the show, uh, the thing about this uh, film club is that uh, uh, we showed Point Break and With Dale and I and uh, Buckaroo Banzai and now uh, this one so far. And uh, the, the kind of pictures I hope that like people just... First of all, I'm going for like movies that are wildly entertaining and inventive and imaginative uh, that are uh, a little bit not, you know, f uh, although Point Break, what are you going to do? Uh, <laughs> that's just, I don't know. I, in some ways, I think it's the 90s Citizen Kane. I really, <laughs> it, like I love Butch Cassidy beyond all measure and Point Break is Butch Cassidy on surfboards and that... <laughs> with even more bromance than Butch Cassidy. And Butch Cassidy's a hardcore bromance. Uh, they die together and... When, oh, golly. In any case, uh, thank you for that. Uh, he was saying the experience of... You've seen it on the television and maybe you've seen it on your phone and whatnot, but to sit together in a theater and... and at one point when they were eating brains wildly, we were eating junior mints down front, and I just... I really... That's what's fun. It's the smell of candy while brains are being eaten that I think makes it. Also, all of the pictures I've shown, and, and particularly Dan O'Bannon, uh, who, who's such a keen and uh, astute student of uh, pictures, 
Um, these are movies about movies, and that's what makes them such great movies. They're referential to all other movies and deferential to all other movies. And uh, within the homage, they don't fucking crank, you know, clank down under their own weight. I think they stand tall like uh, Tyrannosaurus. They don't fucking die like Brontosaurus in the mud, and that's what. Uh, <laughs> and that's important because um, some pictures can be torpid. Uh, where are we now, Robo? Gentleman right here. Oh, okay. Uh, hi. Why you're sitting right next to Dan O'Bannon's grand. Son, nephew. Are you located just for that? Are you located just for the mic? Um, I think. If Hi, I'm, what's if, your name? I'm Mark. Hi, Mark. I think, if I'm not incorrect, and you may be able to confirm this, that this is, in fact, the movie that led to the zombies eating brains sort of cultural point. I, I don't think they ate exclusively brains before. This film. Well, it's a kind of a vague sequel to uh, the the original Night of the Living Dead, right. in which case, and in that movie, as my recollection is, they ate pretty much everything yes. that was available at the supermarket. There was like <laughs> livers and, and arms and all kinds of things. I think you might be right uh, that it, it's the brain. Certainly, the next one, uh, as we discussed earlier, um, the zombies can certainly smell them brains. <laughs> and uh, he, he says, he says, I can smell your brain, Gina. And then later he's like, they smell so good. That's my favorite part. That's my favorite part. Your brain smells so good. He says to his girlfriend through the ceiling. Um, uh, uh, the, uh, I think it is. And, and in Shaun of the Dead, is it the brains as well? I've never seen Shaun of the Dead. I know that's a huge... <laughs> hey, fucking quell your disappointment, bitches. I'll talk with this fucking crowd. You've probably never seen a lot of fucking movies that I've seen or read any books. You fucking illiterate Hollywood types. Don't even fucking awe me. I'll stop this film club right now and turn it into a... That's right, lock the fucking doors. No one leaves this room. I'll eat everyone's fucking brains before this evening's over. Don't diminish me with your fucking patronizing bullshit because I haven't seen a fucking Simon Pegg movie and shit like that. Sweet Maria, this 50 shots of... Fifty Shades of fucking Grey Harry Potter motherfuckers all fucking... Yeah, yeah, I fucking read you. I inhaled you and forgot about you. This, this show started as a celebration. Now it's just me pissing on you. Fucking boo me during a Shaun of the Dead reference and shit. Fucking invented you. I invented cinema. Yeah. Everyone was standing around the fire reenacting the hunt with a pelt on their back. And I said, why don't we have intermittent light that makes it seem more animated? Yeah, that's what I fucking did. What did you do? Nothing is what you fucking did. You read a graphic novel of the Bible. And then pretended like you'd fucking read it and absorbed it in shit. You watched the Discovery Channel about Blackbeard. Now you think you know about pirates and shit. You watched fucking Shark Week is what you did. You didn't memorize Robert Shaw's monologue when you were 13. <laughs> Your brain's not even that fresh. <laughs> I can go to fucking Ralph's and take out my Ralph's card. Yeah, they have fucking brains there and shit. You don't go the hour I go. <laughs> Send more clerks. <laughs> We have time for a couple more questions, I think, before, uh, uh, now that I've alienated you, uh, <laughs> joking, of course, I I, we're going to do another film club in November, uh, maybe we can take a little voice poll here, since you've already made your uh, opinions clear about my, <laughs> my lack of having seen Shaun of the Dead, um, we're thinking about, should it be a Hollywood classic movie, a la... The Big Sleep, you know, uh, Casablanca. I was thinking The Third Man, but The Third Man's long. Um, or should it be a French gangster picture like Touche Pas au Grisby or Any Number Can Win or, you know, Le Cirque Rouge or a Melville film? Or uh, should we do a Sunday afternoon where we show an interminably long fucking movie with an intermission and still do the fucking podcast? <laughs> like a Lawrence of the Arabia or 2001 fucking on a Sunday afternoon. And it's just us together like Nicholas Nickleby on Broadway. There's two meal breaks. I actually dole out food. It'll be like the last waltz. I'm going to make a turkey salad or whatever. 
What did they, I don't remember what they had in that. 2001. What was it? I didn't hear what you said. 2001. Yeah. 2001? Melville. 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 Oh. Melville. I'm getting kind of a semi just talking about Melville. Yeah. I know, right? Uh, but I want girls to come. So uh, we may have to rethink that whole... Although I showed Buckaroo Banzai for the first one and my wife argued me to the ground like fucking Daniel Webster and the devil, man. I was fucking thrown down three times. And she was like, no one is going to come and people fucking came. Uh, Point Break's different. Point Break is like, I don't know what it is. It's an intoxicant for a generation. There's, a, there's really no getting away from Point Break. It's, it, I was wrong before when I, I characterized it as the uh, Citizen Kane. It's more like To Kill a Mockingbird on surfboards. <laughs> Because justice is fucking done. <laughs> okay, we've had some disagreements in the recent past. <laughs> Maybe I came down on you a little harder than I intended to. Maybe I took it a little personal that I haven't seen Shaun of the Dead and you shit all over that. <laughs> Let's take one more question, then we'll fuck off. If, if anybody wants to talk to me now. Hi. Uh, Hi. Sam, my name is Sam. Hi, and, Sam. Uh, Are there no women in this fucking crowd? <laughs> All right, okay. I hear your squeals. <laughs> yes, My Sam. My question is, uh, do you have any recommendations for a horror movie that you would normally watch? Is there one that you watch every year around Halloween, or is there something that you would recommend to watch? I'm pretty squeamish, I'll be honest. Uh, I'm a huge sissy, and I cry at, like, uh, The Wizard of Oz and shit like that. So I'm not the biggest. My wife is much deeper horror fan than I am and, and could recommend you a bajillion uh, films, but I have a couple. Uh, I'd say The Body Snatchers with Boris Karloff is uh, off the deep end fucking weird and, uh, and, and icky. I think anything by Mario Bava, you might start with Black Sunday. Uh, I think, uh, as I mentioned before, Dario Argenta. I think Opera, uh, A Bird with a Crystal Plumage. Um, what's the one where they're all in the girls' school and Jessica Harper does the horrible Suspiria. dance? Suspiria. Suspiria, yeah. The one that has uh, the Goblins uh, song Witch in it. That, that, that I think, is a, a, like wild horror. Um, I think the old 30s Universal ones are, are really groovy. And I think, they're, I think they're showing Thursday Night Here. Uh, the guitar player from Susie and the Banshees is scoring... Um, Carl Jarre's Vampire, which is got that like that's beyond beyond, uh, or um, Nosferatu, um, the original one by Murnau, is uh, uh, has the pixelated uh, coffin that jumps and gets in the in the carriage, and then the carriage drives itself off. Uh, start there. Uh, I also think the Roger Corman Edgar Allan Poe ones from the '60s that he did because they were public domain are really good. There's one that combines Hop Toad and. Uh, 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 Mask of the Red Death, I think it, it, it has like several stories in it, but anyone with Vincent Price where people are barred outside the castle and are dying of the plague is generally a good call. <laughs> Anything with Vincent Price, quite frankly. I, I would say Dr. Fibes and, uh, and Dr. Fibes Rises from the Grave. Uh, but like I say, I'm squeamish. Uh, I, would, I, I watch On the Town and I'm like, oh God. You know. <laughs> On the Town's a musical. Uh, <laughs> wow. Did that go fucking foul? <laughs> Guess we're still smarting over the Sean and the Dad. <laughs> One more and then we'll go. If anyone. No women? No? Okay. All right. I can deal with that. Oh, I can close the show on my own. I don't need you guys. I mean, I appreciate that you've come out tonight. Hmm. Evidently, the uh, interest in having social intercourse with me seems to have waned somewhat. <laughs> I think now what once started as a blossoming, burgeoning film club podcast that people who adored cinema could drop by and listen to at their leisure hours has turned into a hostage situation. <laughs> <laughs> There's another movie on here at midnight, and I'm not of a mind to let anyone go, quite frankly. <laughs> I don't give a shit what you have to do tomorrow. Oh, but I have to go over to Paramount. No, you fucking don't. Not now. Not now. Fairfax High School, a lot of you don't know this, was once a graveyard. You may have noticed tonight when you came over that it was lightly raining. This has been the Greg Proops Film Club. My name is Greg Proops. Thank you very much for coming out. I bid you all good night and everything. Thank you.